Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is November the 20th in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, we're continuing our study in the book of Hebrews, and today we're going to tackle uh, one of the most interesting and maybe debated texts in all of Scripture. And yet, as you'll see, when we keep it in context, it's very simple to understand the thought of the writer. So let's back up for just a moment and let's look at what we have already learned. In chapter 5, we are told that Jesus is our great high priest. He is the one that we can go to to make confession of our sin and to receive forgiveness for those sins. In chapter 4, verse 15, it tells us why. It says, We do not have a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, who cannot understand what it is that we are enduring, but he was in all points tempted like as we are but without sin. Now he's left us a model that we too can live without sin, meaning the practice of sin. There are always attitudes, emotions, feelings, and thoughts we are always going to have to war with, but we can live above the practice of disobedience to God. In chapter 5, verse 8, it tells us that he too had to learn obedience unto the Father by the things which he suffered. Now, in the following verses, carrying us into chapter 6, we have been reminded the importance of reading the Word of God and conforming ourselves to what it teaches us. And so remembering that, that the writer of Hebrews is writing to Christian people followers of Jesus, he says, I want you to leave the elementary practices of when you became a follower of the Lord Jesus, and I want you to move on to higher and deeper things. And we must understand that all of this is based around the reading of the holy written word of God. If we're going to teach others as he's commanded us in chapter 5 verse 12, if we're going to be skillful in the word of righteousness in chapter 5, verse 13, then we're teaching others the word of God. We ourselves are reading the word of God and we're conforming our lives to the word of God. So everything that, that he is discussing is based around the reading and the importance of God's word. Now, having understood this, this is the foundation that we must rest upon if we are to understand this controversial passage. So let's pick up in verse 4. It says, It is impossible for those who were once enlightened, who have participated in the early principles of what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus. As he says in verse 1, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And so he's going to mention here the things that are important to become a follower of the Lord Jesus. We must give ourselves to the doctrine or the teachings of Christ. We must repent from dead works. We must exercise faith in the Lord Jesus. We must adhere to the doctrine or the teaching of baptisms. Notice it says baptisms. There's three baptisms. The baptism of John the baptism of Jesus, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'll do a video on that later. But he says we must conform to the doctrine of baptisms, to the doctrine of laying on of hands. You see, laying on of hands was one of the first things that the early church did in welcoming someone into the kingdom. It indicated that you had fulfilled all the requirements to be a follower of Jesus, and now the fellowship has mutually agreed that now you are a part of the body and no longer a part of the world. We must believe in the resurrection of the dead, that Jesus offers us life after death, and there's something to hope in. And we must believe and understand eternal judgment, that there are consequences to our actions. Now, having done all of these things, you are a follower of the Lord Jesus. You are a new creation. Old things have passed away. 
all things have become new. And so if this is true of you, it is virtually impossible for those who were once enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, if they shall abandon faith in Jesus, it's impossible to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. And so this isn't so much a warning as it is an encouragement. If you will center yourself in the teachings of the Lord Jesus, in the holy writings of God, it is virtually impossible for you to fall away because you are feeding your spirit each and every day and you're becoming stronger in the spirit and weaker in the flesh. And so ground yourself in the word of God. Make this a discipline that you participate in each and every day of your life. Because as we read the word of God and conform ourselves to it, we're automatically going to produce good fruit. And notice, that's what he says in the next verse. For the reason that I say this, because the earth drinks in the rain that comes oft upon it. And it's the rain that nourishes the plants and the vegetation, just as it is the Holy Spirit that nourishes the vegetation within us, our spiritual vegetation, and causes us to grow and produce fruit. He continues and says, as the earth drinks in the rain that comes upon it and brings forth herbs, which is good fruit, for them by whom it is dressed receives blessing from God. And so he's using an example here to drive home the truth he is presenting to us, the importance of reading God's word. Notice what he says in verse 8. But that which beareth thorns or bad fruit and briars is rejected. And it's nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. So as faithful followers of the Lord Jesus who are participating in the study and the reading of his word and conforming ourselves to what we read so that we live like Jesus and not like ourselves, these in verse 9 are the things that accompany salvation. What are the things? Good works. And where do good works come from? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit uses his word to enlighten us so that we will do these good works. We will conform ourselves to his word and will deny and resist the world and the pressure of this world that we live in. He says, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you showed toward his name in that you've ministered to the saints and you do minister. And we desire that every one of you show the same diligence, the same commitment to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you'll not be slothful, lazy, and undisciplined, but you will be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And so back to verse 6 when he says it's impossible for those who were once enlightened, who've once tasted the heavenly gift, who have been made partakers of the Holy Ghost, tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they were to abandon faith in Jesus, it's impossible to renew them again into repentance. Because, says the writer in verse 7, just as the earth takes in rain and produces good fruit to the vegetation that it's feeding, so it is impossible for someone to deny the Lord Jesus who is taking in the teachings of that God has given us through his holy word because good fruit is being produced in them because they are both reading and conforming themselves to what they have read as they study the word of God. I hope that you have seen the simplicity in this truth, friends. If we are to be followers of the Lord Jesus, we must obey what he has taught us. And the only way that we can know what he has taught us is through the written testimony of what has been handed down to us. And so to wrap all of this up into one sentence, it's this simple. If you keep the word of God before you at all times and you're battling to conform yourself to his teachings, it's nearly impossible for you to fall away from the Lord. But the moment that you put down the word of God and you walk away, the odds of your failure and the possibilities of you turning your back on God 
increased dramatically. When I was a young teenager, probably around the age of 13 or 14, my dad gave me a Bible, and in the opening page of that Bible, he wrote, Son, this book will keep you away from sin, or sin will keep you away from this book. And that's the essence of this passage, friend. And that's why we're told in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18, therefore shall you lay up these words, my words in your heart and in your soul, bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontless between your eyes. Teach them to your children. Speak of them when you sit. Speak of them when you're walking by the way. Speak of them when you lie down and speak of them when you rise up. Or in Joshua chapter one, verse eight, this book of the law, my words shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, and you may observe to do according to the, all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Not good success in this life, but good success in being a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus. Well, we're going to close there today, friends, and I trust that the word of God has spoken to you this morning. And it is my deepest desire and prayer for you that you will fall in love with the word of God and you will spend much time in it each and every day. Now, I love you, friends, as Jesus wills, and until tomorrow, I'll see you on the next video. Okay.